So now they're telling them that the church is going to be caught up to heaven and then somebody else is going to go through tribulation. But Paul says, Yea, whosoever shall live in godly shall suffer persecution. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, notice in Daniel chapter 3, when they throw them in the fire furnace, you know what happened? God saved them. And according to Daniel chapter 6, King Darius, when they throw Daniel in the lion's den, God saved Daniel. God helped us to understand that he has the power to stop pain and he's in control. And according to Daniel chapter 12 verse 1, Bible says God's people shall be delivered. Notice, in the time of trouble such as never was. So you don't have to fear mankind. Do not accept that satanic doctrine or gospel, so to speak. It's coming from the Jesuit, the Vatican. You eating Catholic doctrine. That's what you are eating. That's why, and again, Revelation chapter 17, the Bible called this power, Hor, the mother of harlot. Means if this power is a mother, notice, that means that this power has a daughter. It's a Sunday churches that they accept their son worship day. That's why it is Sunday. And you know, watch even the spellings. You find out that's what it is. So friends, Jesus Christ is coming. Whether you go to church or not, friends, take a stand now. Saturday is the biblical day, the Sabbath. Because God knows that in the end, the devil's going to make a lot of people forget the day. It's the holy day that he proved that he is the one who created heaven and the earth. Friends, that's why he began by saying, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Oh, friends, isn't that sad? Said Jesus, Why you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the thing which I say? Says Jesus, These people confess me with their mouth. But their heart is far from me. Luke chapter 23 verses 50 to 56. And also Luke chapter 24 verses 1 to 3. In order for you to understand, you have to know that the Bible says all things was made by Him. So Jesus Christ created this word six days and the seventh day he rested, according to Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. And then when Adam and Eve, they sinned, redemption, he came and he died for us. Friday on the cross, Jesus Christ, he says, it is finished. And then he rested on the Sabbath day. Notice when the sun was going down, Friday evening, they buried Jesus Christ. So the early day in the morning, notice, according to Luke chapter 24, verses 1 to 3, Jesus Christ rose on Sunday. So Jesus Christ kept the Sabbath after the creation. And he kept the Sabbath after redemption. It's a beautiful thing if you understand. That's what biblical Sabbath is all about. And now look how they're uniting their churches. Notice Sunday churches to so-called the mother of the church. They are ecumenical unity. Your Holiness, may I present Archbishop Hayan Barsamian, primate of the Eastern Diocese of the Armenian Church in America. May I present Archbishop Yichen Akachi, the legate and ecumenical officer of the Eastern Diocese of the Armenian Church in America. Representing the presiding Bishop Mark Hansen of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Over this, may I present Bishop Jeremiah J. Park, Bishop of the New York Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church. Your Holiness, may I present Reverend Wesley Granberg Michelson, the General Secretary of the Reformed Church in America. Your Holiness, may I present Reverend Dr. Clifton Kirkpatrick, the stated clerk of the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church in the United States. 
Your Holiness, may I present Reverend Dr. William J. Shaw, President of the National Baptist Convention, United States. Your Holiness, may I present Bishop James Leggett, General Superintendent of the International Pentecost Holiness Church. Your Holiness, may I present Dr. Leith Anderson, President of the National Association of Evangelicals. Your Holiness, may I present Bishop David H. Benke, President of the Atlantic District of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Your Holiness, may I present Reverend Dr. A. R. Bernard, Sr., President of the Council of Churches of the City of New York. Your Holiness, may I present Elder Bernice King, daughter of the civil rights leaders Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King. Your Holiness, may I present Reverend Jimmy Song Jilin, Executive Director of the Council of Churches of the City of New York. Your Holiness, may I present the Right Reverend Mark Sisk, Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of New York. Do you understand the language, Your Holiness? And this is how they call this power. He think he is God. That's what their teachings is all about, friends. And you also know that when the religious leaders, when they come to meet this power, they weren't black. Notice, dark color. They represent the sinners and they represent God. And now listen to what Bible says. This is the chapter. Notice 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. This is the chapter the Protestant Sunday churches. They are forefathers. They used to protest against this power during dark ages. And they call them Antichrist. Notice Antichrist. But now you don't hear from Sunday churches anymore. Because they betray their forefathers. Let's start from verse 3. Notice 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let no one deceive you by any means. For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of predation, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, all that is worshipped, so that he sit as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you this things? And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. Notice what it says in verse 7. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restraining will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteousness, deception among those who perish because they do not receive the love of the truth that they may be saved. Friends, I urge you to call, notice, call this number and order your own book. And the name of the book is The Great Controversy. Notice, The Great Controversy. And by the grace of God, you're going to become a better Christian. You're not going to fall to this Christianity that has become like a coffee and milk shake together. Because the man of sin infiltrating the churches and they destroying doctrines. The phone number here is 856-503-5893. One more time. 856-503-5893. Friends, also if God is touching your heart to support God's faithful ministry so that we can speed up this gospel to a lot of people so that they can hear what you are hearing because heaven is ceaseless ages. Benedict the 16th heads to the U.S. this coming week for his first visit here since being elected Pope three years ago, where the war in Iraq is expected to be high on the agenda. On Friday, Benedict travels to New York, where he will address the United Nations General Assembly. 
The U.N. event was his original reason for coming to the U.S., and many experts believe that speech could be the most important of his trip. Kim Lawton takes a look at the unique role the Pope and the Vatican play on the world stage. Soviet leader Joseph Stalin was once questioned about the influence of the Vatican. Stalin is famously said to have replied, the Pope, how many divisions has he got? The answer, as it turns out, is more than Stalin and many others might have guessed. Experts say the Pope and the Vatican wield considerable global influence. They don't have economic engines they have to feed. They don't have armies. They don't have land. The Vatican is only 106 acres. It's, it's the smallest nation state in the world, but it is a huge moral, spiritual superpower. In questo momento, 